تبارك الذي نزل الفرقان على عبده ليكون للعالمين نذيرا وتبارك الذي جعل في السماء بروجا وجعل فيها سراجا وقمرا منيرا وهو الذي جعل الليل والنهار خلفة لمن أراد أن يذكر وراد شكورا وعباد الرحمن الذين يمشون على الأرض هونا وإذا خاطبهم الجاهلون قالوا سلاما والصلاة والسلام على من بعثه ربه هاديا ومبشرا وداعنا الله بإذنه وسراجا منيرا نشهد أنه بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الغمة وجاهد في الله حق جهاده حتى أتاه اليقين فصلوات الله وسلامه عليه ما تطوع مسك وفاح وما ترنم حمام وصاح وما هذل غرق وناح ثم أما بعد My beloved brothers and sisters in Islam as you were told and as you were aware of the topic or the name or the title of the lecture is issue that concerns from the title you would understand that the whole subject or the topic would be geared towards the youth and what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about the youth and what the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned about them. And how the ulama of the past, starting from the Sahaba of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, until recent ulama and contemporary scholars, we will, may go over what they said about the subject in a nutshell. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yaqul, In Surah Yusuf, لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ عِبْرَةً لِأُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to us indeed in their stories, in the story of the youth, not only the stories of the prophets and the messengers of Allah, but the stories of the youth are included. لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ عِبْرَةً In their stories, there are beautiful lessons that we can learn from them. But these stories, brothers and sisters, لِأُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ For those who will reflect, for those who will ponder about, for those who will think about this subject, لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ عِبْرَةً And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala يقول When he wanted to talk about certain group of young people نَحْنُ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ نَبَأَهُمْ بِالْحَقِّ يقول الله سبحانه وتعالى نَحْنُ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ يَا مُحَمَّدْ we will tell you about their stories with truth. As Allah said, ما كان حديثا يفترى? It wasn't a fabricated story. Someone in Hollywood would come and write the scripture for that. But this is from the book of Allah. ما كان حديثا يفترى? يقول الله سبحانه وتعالى إنهم فتية آمنوا بربهم وزدناهم هدى. This young people, they were فتية. They were young. And then they believed in Allah سبحانه وتعالى. They were living in a society where everything is against what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala desires. 
drinking, fornication, idol worship, worshiping other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, praying to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose a small group of young people. Idqamu. They stood up for the truth. They were not afraid of anyone. They did not desire to please anyone on the expenses of their deen. Idqamu faqalu. When they stood up for the truth. And they went against what the society is doing concerning their law. Concerning, concerning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then they said, إِذْ قَامُوا فَقَالُوا رَبُّنَا رَبُّ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Our Lord is the Lord of the heavens and the earth. And we will not call anyone but to Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Brothers and sisters, in the city of Toronto, in the city of Calgary, Virginia and states, Maryland, Texas, I have seen young people really standing up for the right thing. I have seen them changing their own communities. I have seen them changing the whole environment. I have seen them doing wonders. You know why? Because they were only concerned about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No one else. And this is what we want. This is what Islam is teaching. Is to be different. In a right way, in an acceptable way. Way that would please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But brothers and sisters, this change, it will not come suddenly. We as a parent, we have to start from the beginning. As Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, order your children to pray by the age of seven. You know, by the age of seven. And I would say that is a bit late for the people who are living in the West who don't have any outside influence. However, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, give them the direction, direct order. Ask them to perform the salah. Ask them. Because when the child is in that state and he wants to, you know, start salah at that age, or when the child starts praying at that age, by the age of 10, as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would not need the help of the parents. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us to start from the beginning, from day one. My first daughter, when she was a year and a half, I realized that, hey, this young girl, she understands what I'm saying. Not only she understands, she links things together. She knows when I will say, let us eat, we have to go to the table. And when I say, let us go, she runs for her shoes. So I said, hey, what if I put the hijab next to the shoes? And I say, let us go get the shoes and the hijab. Some of the parents, when we start implementing this, oh, that's a child of you. Oh my God. Oh, she's so cute. Your father ordered you to do this? Look at, her, look at her hair. Look how she... But she realized, subhanAllah, she realized from that age, and it's, you know, I don't have to wear because she's wearing a diaper. She has no wudu anyway, you know. But she will come. She will come to the masjid wearing her little cute hijab. Asya is running around, you know, talking in the salah, trying to pray foot to foot with the other children, and the other children chasing, running away, and she's chasing them, telling them, be quiet during the salah. And why? Because she learned from that age. 
And I'm not saying I'm a good father. Her mother did a wonderful job with her. But I'm telling you, if we start from young age, we can see the fruit of that very soon. Very soon. And I remember my second daughter, Asma. When she was two years old, now, because she's her oldest sister wearing hijab, she started wearing hijab day and night. And then they were playing together, and she was going backward, but she didn't see that she, she didn't realize she was walking on her bed, and she fell off the bed head first. Now, father and mother being concerned, we rushed her to the emergency. Before we left, she's crying. She's bawling tears everywhere. She said, hijab, my hijab. So we put the hijab on just to keep her quiet. Be quiet. And then we went to the x-ray room. And the guy said, take off the hijab. And she was like, no, I'm not taking off the hijab. Wallahi, she said, I'm not taking off the hijab. I said, fine, can you do something? She was good. He was good, alhamdulillah. He said, I'll try my best. But the doctor said, no. I want to feel her hair. I want to touch her skull. I want to see that. I want to feel and see if there's anything, you know, other than what we can see. And she said, Daddy, he's a man. He cannot touch my hair. <laughs> She's only two. And I said, I'm sorry, sir. And the guy was very rude. He said, if you want me to treat your daughter, she must remove the hijab. Being a concerned father, I tried to remove the hijab. I said, sweetie, let me re She said, no. So we looked at each other, myself and her mother, and we tried everything. It wouldn't work. So we took it by force. She cried. And she cried. And I'm looking at her, she's crying, screaming her head off. And then she turned away from me after he touched her head. And she said, Daddy, you let a man touch my hair. And she turned away. I was like, oh Allah, she's only two years old. And she is making me so guilty that I allow a man to touch her hair. No. What is the lesson? The lesson is, if we want to change them, we should not come to the imams, and all of the imams here understand this, and say to the imam, oh, imam, imam, my daughter, she, she did something wrong. What did she do? She has a boyfriend. And you say, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. And you assume She's 13, 14, 15 years old. And, she, and he comes in and I said, I ask, how old is she? And he says, she's, she's young, she's only 19. And I'm looking at him, it's like, where are you from? She's 19 and she's a baby? And I said, when was the last time you asked her to wear hijab? And he said, well, well her mother wears hijab when she goes to the masjid. And I said, you want me to have, to, I'm sorry, to bring out Musa's stick, alayhi salam, the magic stick, or the powerful stick, I should say. There was no magic in it. And say, boom, she's a righteous young lady. Take her home and say salam alaykum to her. It's not going to happen. We have to work with the children. We have to be there for them. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as we know, with Hadith Abdullah ibn Abbas, he said, Ya Ghulam, young boy, in you alimuk, alimuk kalimat. I'm teaching you a powerful words. Now listen. So the Messenger of Allah, he told this young man whom to rely on. And he said, Ida sa'alta fas alillah, wa ida sta'anta fas ta'in billah, fid Allah yahfad, protect Allah and Allah will protect you. If you ask, ask Allah, and if you need, ask of Allah. He taught him from the first day. Not until he was 18 or 19, from the first day. 
Now, this is what we need as parents to understand. I'll tell you a story of a young man that was raised under the, under the hands or under the watch of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this young man's name was Abdul Rahman bin Thalaba. And I want all of you to remember. His name was Abdul Rahman bin Thalaba. Abdul Rahman bin Thalaba was a young man, young boy, who reached the age of puberty who loved Rasulullah so much that he wanted to be next to him all the time. Rasulullah said to this young man who was always with him, Ya Abdi Rahman, go get me something. And he asked him to get something from somewhere. Abdi Rahman, in his way to what Rasulullah asked, he passed by the, one of the houses of the Ansar. And the Ansar, as the Sheikh explained earlier, was the helpers who helped the people who migrated, migrated from Mecca. In that, while he was going, he saw a crack in one of the houses of the Ansar, and he saw a young lady enter. He looked you know, out of curiosity, and he saw a young lady who's taking bath, shower. Ah, now the shaitan stopped playing with his mind. Nobody can see you. It is very, you know, quiet area. You know, just look. And he peeked and he looked. And then he remembered that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching him. And he said, oh my God, imagine now, imagine one of the young guys nowadays He's passing by your house and he sees a woman, undressed woman, and he will say, <laughs> and then he will quote the hadith of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Hadith Ali. The first look is for you, and the second look is against you. And he would be standing there for how many hours? That look would be as long as he as he can dress up. This Young man, he remembered. And he said, oh my God. I sat, I sit, I sit next to the messenger of Allah. And he, I'm serving him. And this is what I do. And he ran out of the city. And he said, we'll never go back to the messenger of Allah. Because Allah is going to reveal to the messenger. And Allah is going to expose my sin. And Rasulullah will never ever talk to me again. I cannot see him. I cannot look at him. I'm leaving the city. And he left the city. You know, that is what I call life iman. If the sin doesn't hurt, if the sin doesn't really cause pain in the heart, and you don't rush back to Allah, then there's something is wrong with us. This young man, he ran. And he left the city. And Umar, Rasulullah said, Ya Umar, I asked Abdul Rahman to get me something. Where is he? He was nowhere to be found. And then a day passed, two, three. And he said, Ya Umar, you and Salman, go and search for this young man. And they went outside the city, inside the city, everywhere they couldn't find. Rasulullah said, no, go see what happened to him. So they went outside the city limits, and they found this shepherd. And they said, have you seen a young boy with that description? And he said, I don't know who you're talking about. I know a young boy that we call him al baka the one that weeps. He comes from the mountain, and we give him some milk, and he leaves. Umar bin Khattab said, how tall is he? He said, he's that tall. He said, perhaps that is the one. And then, shortly after, the young man came, looking down, tears on his cheek, very tired, very weak, can hardly move. And then he came to the man, and the man gave him some milk, and Umar and Salman are hiding somewhere. And the little boy, 
the tears that was coming from his eyes of filling the milk or the container that had milk and he's drinking mixed milk and tears together and Umar ibn Khattab came out of nowhere and he said, Ya Abdirrahman and the young boy he got shocked and he threw the milk and he wants to run away and said, Rasulullah asking about me. Allah must have spoke about me. I'm a munafiq, I cannot go back. So I must say, no. Rasulullah wants to see you. Let's go. So they brought this young man, but out of fear for what he did, he got extremely ill even before they got to the city. And then Umar said, we cannot take him to the messenger of Allah. He's too sick, too ill. Let us take him to his house and let us inform the messenger of Allah what is happening. So Umar said, Ya Rasulullah, the young boy is sick and this is what's happening. Please, if you want, come and see him. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he went with the young boy and he realized the young boy is ill. When the young boy saw the messenger of Allah, and coming and approaching him, he said, Ya Rasulullah, I'm a sinner. Stay away from me. Don't come closer to me. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, being a mercy, because Allah said in the Quran, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ We only sent Ya Muhammad so you can be a mercy for all mankind. He picked the head of this young man and he sat him up and he put him again on his thigh. And the young boy is saying, Ya Rasulullah, I'm a filthy person. I committed ma'asiyah. Ya Rasulullah, don't touch me. You are the messenger of Allah, you're pure. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam comfort this young man. And the young man felt comfortable with Rasulullah. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, I feel, I feel there is something in my body. I feel there is something moving inside of my body. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, do you feel that? He said, yes. قال, ya Abdirrahman, say the shahada. Say, la ilaha illallah, malak al maut is about to approach. And the young man died. And the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told that the malaika of Allah, so the angels were there to witness the janazah of that young man. Why? Because he repent. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught the young people how to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, let us talk about the youth nowadays. What is the problem with the youth? What do we have with them? You know, nowadays as parents, as society, as community, we really don't give them directions. We are eager to build masajid. We want to dismiss it this big. The mineral has to be so high. You know, the member have to reach the roof. You know, and then you ask, what do you have for the youth? They say, oh, they can pray in the, in the back room. That is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, is there a gym for them? Is there a recreation room for them? Is there a place when they want to have fun they say, I don't want to be YMCA. I may go there and see something that is not appropriate. I might find or some, you know, some weak Muslims may go and find someone who's you know, smoking things and selling things to them, drugs. I know, let us bring them inside. No, we all want to build a huge, nice masjid. And then when the masjid is there, and we open the masjid other than Fridays and Eid and Ramadan, the masjid is empty. Where's everyone? Oh, they're playing basketball outside. Why don't you bring them inside? Why don't we just bring them inside and say to them, let's just stop, time for salah, let's go. And they will all go and they will all follow. Look at the sisters, mashallah. Look at the sisters, beautiful sisters. Beautiful indeed. You know, don't get me wrong. Okay. 
Oh, yeah, you have a you know, security camera watching all the scissors. No, you know, beautiful in them, but look at them. Look at them. They came and they said to this society, I'm a proud Muslim. I'm proud of who I am. You know, I'm not a person, as you guys say. I wear niqab because this is what I believe is far. I wear hijab because this is what I believe is part of my religion and it's far for me. I chose to put this on. I want to be a Muslim, a dignified Muslim. And then we say to them in the masjid, that little corner is for the sisters. I said, unacceptable. Look at the sisters, mashallah. Don't look at them, brothers. You know. I'm telling you, the majority of the people here are sisters. You know, give them time. Do they have swim? Do they want to swim instead of going, sending them to public swimming pools? Create that for them. They want to have fun and entertain themselves. Let us bring that to the masjid and let the masjid be there for them. So we are really not doing much as a Muslim community in general, other than Alhamdulillah, I think that changed you know, with a lot of uh, organizations. And now every masjid thinking about, okay, maybe I should put, uh, put a gym with the, with the masjid and add something else so they can be attracted. Now, I'll tell you some of the problems that we have with the youth and you can work with me and see we, how we can solve this problem. First of the problem is we, the, we're living in a society that is almost corrupted based. I'm talking about in their principles. In this society, have a girlfriend. Is that okay? Perfectly fine. As a matter of fact, if you don't have a girlfriend, something is wrong. Oh, you're one of those guys. I know. You know. That's what it is. That you're one of those guys if you don't have girlfriend. If you don't have boyfriend, ah, oh, she's sick. In my school, no disrespect for anyone, but it was, you know, public school. A father comes to the advisor. And he's complaining about his daughter. What is the problem? She's bad at school? No. How is her marks? Perfect student. And he says, you know, my daughter doesn't have a boyfriend. I want you to help her psychologically because you're the counselor, something is wrong with her. In this society, that is acceptable. In Islam, we say, no, there is no gender relationship before marriage and should it stay like this. Now, in them living in this society, then we have to understand that that is an issue with Ummah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and with the problem that we have. The other problem that they're facing is the media, you know, papers, magazines, internet, or, you know, TV, shows, you know, everything is about how you should live. And we always, they always have this, you know, this marriage that was initiated between two through love, and then they live happily ever after. They never tell you that they got divorced three months later, but they tell you they live happily ever after. We have young people who are also witnessing this, and it is also corrupting them. Also, we have in the society that we need to tackle problems such as gangs, drug dealers, you know. And these young people will say, hey, you're young, you're strong, you, you, all the you know, you know, desire is there for the opposite gender, but you cannot touch them unless you have some money. But you can also, you can't work because you don't have the qualification and the, and the degree that is necessary. At the same time, it is all yours. And even if you work, they will tell you you have no experience. So how should we solve this problem? How that young man can solve this problem? He will go and seek quick cash. And quick cash means join one of those corrupted gangs. Or sell drugs. You know, sell just a dr sell drugs. A brother who told me, who became a Muslim, he said, for me to maintain my habit, I have to sell 
drugs to grade 10, 11, 12 students. Just to, just to survive. So in this, in this society, they have everything available for them, but at the same time, they cannot get to it because of the finest, and that pushes them. Also, because of that, we don't have role models, figure role models. If you ask these young you know, thugs and you grab them, who's your role model? What is he going to say? 50 cents. Why 50 cents? Why not a dollar? 50 cents. You know. Because this is who they know. This is what they know. Now, I only have 10 minutes to solve the issue of the Ummah. But this is what I will say. Every masjid, every organization must try to accommodate with accommodate youth. And even the non-Muslim organizations, we should work with them. We should. If you go to your neighbor community and you say, listen, I have a problem with young teenagers getting pregnant. Let us work together. I have a problem with those drivers who are, you know, drink drivers or drunk drivers. I have a problem. Let us work together. They will definitely help us and they will definitely give us the helping hand. So let us utilize those. My nasihat to the young people of this ummah, ikhwati fillah, would be the following. Number one, understand and know that you are Muslim. And what does Muslim, being a Muslim means? Means, number one, you belong to a beautiful religion. You belong to a religion that has everything and your religion is the best. Because nobody's asking you to worship anything else but your creator, the one that created you, the one that fashioned you, the one that gave you this health that you're enjoying, the one that gave you all the ni'mah, all of it is from Allah and you only worship that. And this is your deen, the most beautiful religion. One religion that I know that allows all other cultures, all other religions to live under them peacefully. We know that for a fact. Al-Islam is the only religion in the history that we know in the past that allows people to live in peace together in Palestine and elsewhere in you know, um, North Africa was an excellent example. Number two, you cannot change anything, and this is for the youth. You cannot change anything unless you change yourself. You know, we have a problem. And I'll admit, I have that problem too. And that is, we want to look good from outside. You know? We want to look good from outside. But we're not really all that inside, not all of us. So what I want you to do as a young man, as a young lady, take this stand and say, this is my deen, this is my religion, this is my society, this is my community. I live here. I'm going to make this place a better place. I'll make sure this place nourishes a better, I have better, and you know, they have better understanding of Islam. I'll tell you something. And the speaker, one of the guys who are here, as a matter of fact, he did this. And I'll tell you this because us who were born in an Islam, we really don't appreciate Islam. And Umar ibn Khattab used to say, this thing will be destroyed from individuals who were born and raised in this deen, never experienced the other side of darkness. Now look at the new Muslims. When they accept Islam, they want to live Islam, not culture. They want to live Islam, not desire. They want to make wherever they're living a better place. In the States, it was a common knowledge. When Muslims moved to a neighborhood, the real estate value would go down initially, and the people would move out. 
But that changed. Why? Because people realize that it's not the case. Muslims are the best neighbors to have. And who made that possible? Individuals who had the concern of being a decent Muslim. And most of these individuals, I should say, are new Muslims. Now, I'll tell you an example of one of them. I'm not talking about Dr. Bilal Phillips who wrote so many books about Islam from Tawheed to, you know, women's issue and youth issue. I'm not talking about him. I'm not talking about Abdul Hakim Quick who did so many documentaries about Islam. I'm not talking about Yusuf Estes who gave shahada to a thousand, thousands of people. I'm talking about another person who accepted Islam also. And when he accepted Islam, and he became the Imam of his community. Guess what he did? He invited every single person in the neighborhood. And he said, we are here to stay, live in peace. Join us or live with us in peace. And shortly after that, the place that he used to be full of drug dealers, prostitution. They cleared that out. Shortly after that, he went to the city hall and he said, I don't like the name of the street. I don't like the name of the street. We are Muslim. This is our street. Change. And the city realized the work that this man did and how he changed his community. And they said, we will change the, the, street, the name of the street for you. And then he said to the city, no non-Muslim police officers should be in this area. And they hired non-Muslim police officers. He changed his community. He did not cry and he said, oh, you know, we're living in a Western society. You know, we can never practice Islam here. It's too difficult. You know, they don't know. These guys, they use drugs. He did not cry over that. But he said, let us change. And all the time, all the time, the people who can really make the change are the people who accepted Islam or people who were born and raised here. You know why? Because they have no fear of anything as long as they're not doing anything wrong. So they're the one who can handle the issue better. The other nasiha that I will say to the Muslims and the non-Muslims who are living in this country and whoever is living in this country, I will say to the Muslims, to Muslim youth, establish your relationship with your God. Establish your relationship with your Lord. Establish your relationship with Allah and hide some of your deeds from the people. If it's not all of them, if it's not the majority of your action, hide it from the people and let that check be cash on the day of Yom al Qiyamah. Let that be cash on the day of Yom al Qiyamah. And they say, nobody knew, Ya Allah, about this except you and I. This is what I did, and this is on my scale on the day of Yawm Al-Qiyamah. And follow the example of the Sahaba of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is what I have to say. Now you know the name, now you know the game. If you want to be with them, you got to be the same. Wajzakumullah khair. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.